Hi all, welcome back to another video. Today I will be talking about some of the hardest things I had to do at my Japanese language school so that you can get a better idea of what a professional language school program can entail. This list is not in any particular order because the difficulty level is very subjective. Something that could be hard for me could be a walk in the park for someone else. So this is just my personal opinion and my personal experience. And once again, I apologize for all the car noises and background noises you hear due to poor soundproofing. With that being said, let's get started. Number one, phone call. So I was enrolled into the absolute beginner class of the Japanese language program. And if I recall correctly, in the beginning of the third week, we had to make a phone call to a public library to ask a question in Japanese. So there was like a lottery of sorts where we randomly picked a piece of paper and the piece of paper had the name of the library, the phone number, and questions we were supposed to ask. The main question for all of us to ask was, what are your business hours? And there was an optional question asking, how much does it cost to use the copy machine? At first, we didn't really understand what was going on because class was taught in Japanese and we had to figure out what the teacher wanted from us. And we were all terrified when we understood what was happening. I was like, oh my god, are we really doing this? Because listen, I have only been learning Japanese for two weeks. And on the Monday of the third week, I'm already expected to call people up asking things in Japanese. Is this really happening? I'm telling you, my language school does not fool around. They mean business. And it was not like we all pick up our cell phone and all call at the same time. No, 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 that would be too easy. It was one person calling at a time and the entire class and your teacher will be listening in on your call. Pressure, right? So we had to ask the question, listen to the reply and take notes on the answer and whatever else they were saying. Afterwards, when you hang up the call, the teacher will ask you questions like, what are the business hours? What day do they rest and not open for business? And what else did you pick up from what was said? So I volunteered to go first and I only asked the main question. I didn't even get into the optional question because my hands were shaking from anxiety. But my call went pretty smoothly and it was a very straightforward call. I got the answer I needed and that was that. One of my classmates though was not that lucky. The person on the other end of the line was going on and on and we had no idea what was being said. So the teacher had to indicate to my classmate to just say, ah, wakarimashita, arigatou gozaimasu, and to hang up the phone. Later, the teacher explained to us that the library was closed due to renovations. The staff was trying to give my classmate directions to a close by library and was trying to tell my classmate when the library will be open again. This activity was difficult because you never know what the person on the other end of the line will say and you kind of have to be quick on your feet. The staff member on the other end of the line might ask you where are you coming from and try to give you directions on how to get there. And if you have no idea what's being said, then what do you say or do? And a side note, hanging up without saying anything is a big no-no in Japan. This phone call activity was a one-time deal. I didn't have to do this ever again in class, unlike the next thing on my list. Number two, interviews. Every Thursday, we had to do an activity called interview. Usually we had to go down to the first floor and interview the admin staffs. Every week, the question or topic changes, but each time we randomly chose an admin staff to talk to and asked them the interview question the teacher gave us. We had to write down the staff's name and take notes on what was being said. And the teacher would walk around listening in on our conversation and take notes. And when we go back to our classroom, we share our answers. This activity serves to hone our speaking and listening skills. So the hard thing about this activity was that the people we were interviewing are administrative staffs. They are not teachers. It was difficult and awkward for them to dumb down their Japanese to a two-year-old level. And oftentimes, they don't know how to do it. Which is understandable because if you ask me to dumb down my English to a two-year-old level while speaking to a fully grown adult, it would be awkward and hard for me too. So there was a bit of cognitive dissonance going on. 
But when they spoke normal Japanese, which they did, I didn't really understand what they were saying. So a lot of times, I would have to ask them to repeat themselves, like at least four to five times. Literally, I kept saying to them, Sumimasen, mo ichito onigaishimasu. So I'm pretty sure they got frustrated, but of course, they're professionals, they never showed it, and they understand we were absolute beginners at Japanese. These interviews, for me at least, were really awkward, so I don't enjoy them at all, but they really do put your listening abilities to the test. With that said though, I heard that the upper classes didn't have to do these interviews every week because they had way too many students and there were not enough staff members. If they did these interviews for every single class, every single week, the admin staffs would not have time for any administrative work. So weekly interviews were very exclusive to my beginner class because we only had five people. I did have to do some interviews in my second quarter. I don't remember how many we did anymore, but it was definitely not done every single week. Number three, speaking test. At Yamasa, there is a speaking test that they conduct at the end of each quarter to see how well you communicate in Japanese. My classmates and I knew that this speaking test was going to happen. What we didn't know was how it was going to happen. For all we knew, we thought we were just going to be talking to each other in Japanese and our teacher would be listening in on our conversation the way she has been doing for the last 10 weeks. But no, that was not how it worked. If my memory serves me well, this is what went down. My homeroom teacher knew that all of us were going to freak out when we knew how this test was going to be done. This test was originally scheduled for the early morning, but the school had to move our schedule around, so we ended up taking an early lunch, and the test was done after lunch. And my teacher did not explain to us how it's going to be conducted until right before our lunch break. So we had exactly 50 minutes to freak out, minus the time it took for us to choke down our food. During test time, there were two questions written on the whiteboard and we had to partner up with our classmate and have a conversation in regards to those two questions. One partner would start off asking the question, the other partner would answer. But this is not an interview, it is a conversation and the speaking test tests you on how well you can converse in Japanese. So if and when you take this test, don't be robotic. It's not partner A asks a question, partner B responds, partner B asks a question, partner A responds, the end. That is too dry and robotic, and my teacher straight up said that's not what they wanted to see. They want to see you have a conversation that flows. And when I say they, I'm talking about the test administrators with an S because your teacher will not be conducting this test. Your teacher will only be there to observe and facilitate and nothing else. So when I was taking this test, there were two to three administrative staffs that came in with clipboards to evaluate us. And I say two to three because there were actually a lot of admin, admin staffs walking around, coming in and out of the classrooms. I think they were trying to coordinate with each other because this test was taken by almost all the classes in the entire school. And I have never seen these admin staffs before. They were as good as absolute strangers to me. And their job was to walk around, jot down notes, evaluate our speaking abilities, and even ask us questions. Pressure, right? I think they were looking for our grammar usage, vocabulary usage, our rhythm, cadence, intonation, pronunciation, how well our conversation flowed, how well we listened, how well we, we responded, etc. So they can evaluate our overall comprehension of the Japanese language and our ability to communicate in it. This speaking test isn't timed. It will take as long as it needs to take for the test administrators to evaluate each student. We had the entire afternoon to do this. I believe this test lasted for 75 minutes in my first quarter and I didn't bother looking at the clock in my second quarter. To further elaborate, we didn't just have one partner during the speaking test. Every 10 to 15 minutes or so, our homeroom teacher will tell us to switch partners. So we had to begin the conversation all over again with each new partner and get in flow with each other ASAP. 
And this went on until the test administrator said that they were done observing us. I will tell you that the very first quarter was the hardest in regards to this speaking test because as absolute beginners, our toolbox were very limited. Our grammar was limited, our vocabulary was limited, we barely started learning about past tense, present tense, and future tense. So all of us were speaking in two-year-old Japanese, trying to have engrossing conversations with our limited toolbox. And we literally used every drop of Japanese we learned in the last 10 weeks to take this speaking test. And let me tell you, after this test, my brain was fried, my voice was hoarse, my mouth was dry. When I walked home with my friends after class, I told them straight up, I will not be talking because my brain is completely out of commission. But I will tell you this, the more Japanese you know, the easier this test gets because you have more tools in your toolbox. And a lot of my upperclassmen friends didn't think too much of this test. From what I gathered, it was actually pretty easy for them. Number four, end of the quarter performance. At the end of the quarter, the students were asked to volunteer to perform something for the entire school during the end of the quarter ceremony. It could be anything from singing to acting to dancing, etc. as long as you're entertaining the entire school. These end of the quarter performances are not mandatory, at least for the other classes. But for my absolute beginner class, we were not given the choice. The teacher expected and wanted us to perform something, and she even helped brainstorm some ideas with us because she really wanted us to do this. We chose to do a trivia game show, and I volunteered to be the team leader. We were not given class time to work on the performance, so we had to squeeze the preparation in during lunchtime and class breaks while in the middle of preparing for presentations and a lot of tests. We couldn't do it after class because some of my classmates had work and other obligations. So we had very limited time to work on this performance. In fact, it was the very last thing on our minds because we had a million other things to do before the end of the quarter. And this performance really was just extracurricular activity. It's not graded or anything. It doesn't go into our student evaluations. So we were in a crunch for time and we had to figure out how we were going to do this game show. I told my classmates we should make a list of questions to ask the entire school and give out chocolates as a reward if they got the answer right. It was simple enough and so that's what we did. We came together and made a list of questions. But down the line, at some point, two of my classmates told us they were not going to be at the end of the quarter ceremony. They were taking the day off. So I had only two other classmates left to work with, which means there was a total of three of us and not much time. This game show was not scripted. My classmates and I didn't have time to come together to script anything. Like I said, amidst a million things to do, this was the very last thing on our minds. And one of my classmates, at the very last minute, on the day of the performance, asked a senpai to script something out so she knows what to say. And props to her for trying. She's always been a very diligent classmate. But the script she had was way above our Japanese level. So as the team leader, I had to make a judgment call. Do we use the scripts or not? Do I lay the burden on my teammate? What ran through my mind was, when you're standing in front of an auditorium filled with over a hundred people trying to regurgitate words in Japanese that you just learned, in all likelihood, it's not going to end well. There's a very high probability that she's going to freeze and forget what she wrote because of anxiety. And even if she simply read off the scripted lines from the paper, it's going to sound very robotic and choppy because this was Japanese that was really too advanced for us. And both of my teammates were the younger classmates, 16 and 18 years old. They were super nervous and terrified when they saw the amount of people walking into the auditorium. And I was too. But this is where life experience comes into play. So I told them, don't worry about it. I'll do the talking and you guys just follow my lead. As a team leader, that is my duty. I bear the brunt of this. And to be very honest, I had no idea what I was going to say in front of the entire school. Like I said, I don't have anything scripted. But if I had learned anything in life, it's that energy is contagious. And if you set the tone and have confidence and conviction, people follow your lead. 
so I just went improv. Whatever came to my mind was what I said. And I only used my two year old Japanese because that was what I knew. It was all simple sentences, basic grammars, very easy vocabulary, nothing fancy at all. But the reason I was confident in my ability to improv was because I had spent 10 weeks of class time doing nothing but speak Japanese, from role playing to interviews to class presentations to speaking tests to all kinds of tests. And constantly asking and answering questions in class. Japanese became automatic. I was eating, sleeping, pooping, and thinking in Japanese. And I'm happy to say that our game show was a success. We pulled it off because the energy I put forth was one of fun, high energy, and confidence. And props to my two teammates for picking up on what I was doing and going along with it. My schoolmates had lots of fun. I had lots of fun. I'm pretty sure my teammates were thrilled that it turned out so well. This is by far the most nerve wracking yet thrilling thing I've done at my Japanese language school. Some of my senpais came up to me later and complimented me and said, That was a really good performance. Good job. And I will admit, I was very proud of myself. I gave myself a good pat on the shoulders for a job well done. So, for those of you who think language school isn't worth it, let me tell you, it's worth it. Language school programs, the good ones, hone and reinforce s your language skills so much that you eat, sleep, poop, and think in Japanese. The language becomes automatic. In emergency situations such as this performance, your brain will go on Japanese autopilot. With that said, you do need to be confident in your ability and let your brain do its thing. Because more often than not, a lot of people overthink it, and the anxiety is what causes them to freeze and blank out. So, despite it being one of the most nerve wracking things I've done at my language school, I still recommend that you volunteer to perform if you're going to Yamasa or if your language school does this type of activity. In my second quarter, I didn't do any performance, but a lot of my schoolmates did perform, and it was really cool to watch. These types of activities do make going to a language school much more fun and much more well rounded. It is a thousand times better than just sitting in a classroom going through the textbooks. Last but not least, conjugations. I was warned by my senpai that this was going to be a lot of fun. I didn't even know that Japanese had conjugations. For the longest time, I thought speaking my two year old Japanese was normal Japanese until I learned about conjugations. And before you laugh at my foolishness, you need to understand where my logic came from. You see, I've been learning Mandarin for a very long time, and in Chinese, there are no conjugations. So I thought, since Japanese uses kanji so much, that this might be the same deal. Sounds logical, right? Makes sense, right? But no, Japanese is not like Chinese. And for those of you who don't know what conjugations are, it's when you change a verb to reflect tense, mood, person, etc. For example, the verb break can be conjugated into breaks, broke, broken, and breaking. Speaking of which, I am so glad I don't have to learn English as a second language because English has a ridiculous amount of conjugations. If you really think about it, English has a ridiculous amount of grammar rules. But I digress. Conjugations aren't hard. What was hard was how you get bombarded by all the conjugations that you must learn in one quarter, which is only a 10 week span. This is why I keep saying that if you are an absolute beginner going to a language school, you must bring your A game. There's no slacking off, there's no daydreaming in class, there's no dozing off in the back of the class. I was struggling to keep up with memorizing all the conjugations, and my teacher knew it. The one thing I feel they really like to do in my Japanese language school is they like to put you on the spot, especially if your teacher knows that you are falling behind. And to be fair, they're not doing it to be mean spirited, they're trying to help you learn. So, in my second quarter, the teacher would pick students to conjugate verbs on the spot. And let me tell you, I would get picked so often because I didn't know my stuff. There was a day when I got really exasperated with my teacher because I was constantly being picked to conjugate verbs. And I thought to myself, 
There are nine other students in class. Why did the teacher keep picking on me? And there were other students who got conjugations down pat, who kept raising their hands to answer the teacher's conjugation questions, but they never got picked. Towards the end of the class, I couldn't even hide my displeasure, and all of my classmates felt the tension. They were probably thinking, why did the teacher constantly pick on Kei-san when she didn't even raise her hand? Well, it's because my teacher knew that I didn't know my conjugations. And I guess it's her way of saying, you better get on it. Because you know, Japanese people are very passive aggressive, and I'm not saying this with any hate or judgment. They won't tell you that you're falling behind. They'll show you that you're falling behind in the most painfully obvious manner. While Americans will straight up tell you, you're falling behind in class, you better get your act together. So guess what I did after that day? I cracked open the textbook and made sure I knew my conjugations. And I remember talking to my senpais and I said, you know, I'm really struggling with memorizing these conjugations and I'm super stressed out. I feel like everything is going right over my head. And they consoled me and told me that the second quarter really is the hardest. But don't worry because in the third quarter, you don't really learn any new conjugations anymore. Instead, they focus more on reviewing and reinforcing what you learned in the second quarter. And I'm speaking specifically on conjugations only. In the third quarter, you still have to learn new grammar points, vocabulary, kanjis, the whole nine yard. So, a word on Yamasa's program. If you start as an absolute beginner, the first three quarters are where you get your basic foundations down pat. If you look at Yamasa's program as a whole, I can understand why the school chose to put conjugations down for the second quarter and then reinforcing and reviewing everything you learned in the third quarter. It makes sense on paper to do it that way. But for the students going through this program, you really have to bring your A-game. There's no slacking off. You can't hide in the back corner desk pretending like you're paying attention while you doze off. The second quarter was difficult enough that I had a classmate drop down a class in the middle of the quarter. And there were people who chose to take this class over again. So just FYI, you are allowed to repeat the class if you feel the need to. To further elaborate, at the end of the quarter, the teacher will ask you if you want to progress to the next quarter. This is where the student pick and choose the class they want to take. And it doesn't have to be a linear progression. You can go up or down to different tier classes as you see fit. I know schoolmates who drop down a tier. Some chose to repeat the same class and some went up a few tiers. When the quarter begins on the very first week, you are allowed to try out the class and move classes depending on how you feel. The first week is usually where all the movements happen before people kind of settle in. But as I said, I had a classmate who dropped down a class in the middle of the quarter. I don't know if they made an exception for her due to particular reasons, but as you can see, Yamasa's program is very flexible. At no point do you have to follow their linear program to a T. And I'll end on that note. As always, if you have any questions, comment below. If you got any value from this, please give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you next time. Matane.